Hey Dreamers, it's your host Joe Pardo. So next week is the last week that Dreamers Podcast can be on iTunes new and noteworthy. I want to thank everyone for the amazing support I've already had with the show. Dreamers Podcast is already nearing 10,000 downloads and should cross that mark by the end of the weekend. I'd like to send a big thank you out to Reed for sending me an email about how much he appreciates the inspiration he, he's getting from this show. Please keep the emails coming in. I really appreciate all of them, and I'd love to respond to any of them, any questions or any comments you have about the show. If you could, I'd really appreciate you taking 30 seconds to review the show on iTunes to help gain exposure. I hope everyone has a magical weekend. Take care. This is the Dreamers Podcast, where dreamers share their stories to inspire you. Now, join host Joe Pardo as he interviews a dreamer who's living their dreams. Welcome to the Dreamers Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Pardo, and today I am interviewing Jared Diamond, who is living his dream through journalism. Welcome to the show, Jared. Hi, how's it going? It's it's going wonderful. How about yourself? It's going great. <laughs> we avoid outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Hotsburg. <laughs> Let's get started by giving some background about yourself. Sure. Uh, well, my name is Jared Diamond, like you said. I work for the Wall Street Journal in New York, uh, the newspaper, obviously. My job there is writing about baseball right now, specifically the New York Mets. Uh, I follow them all around the country, go to all their games, and I write about it. And it's pretty fun. <laughs> it definitely does sound fun. We were, maybe we were talking before the show about some of the cities, some of your most favorite cities and some of your least favorite cities. I don't know if you're willing to divulge that. Well, I, could, I won't talk about the least favorite. I don't want to offend your <laughs> listeners in Saint Cincinnati and St. Louis. But San Francisco is uh, the best spot. But Philadelphia is great, too, right here where we are right now. Yeah, right here in the studio. <laughs> so what would you say inspires you? Oh, what inspires me? I mean, words inspire me in a lot of ways. I mean, I've always sort of just been captivated by words. I always talked way too much as a kid, which is probably annoying for people. But writing lets me uh, talk without talking. That annoying everyone around me. And, you know, I was just sort of fascinated by uh, the best ways to describe things and how to sort of paint a picture with words. What I do now really lets me lets me do that and bring people into this world that I'm in. So how did your dream get started? It's, it was a long road. Uh, it really in many ways started when I was just a little kid. I, I always loved sports my entire life. I was not very good at them. Not as good as I would have liked to have been. And I think I figured out pretty quickly around the age of probably 10 that I was not going to be playing Major League Baseball because I cannot run and I cannot hit and I cannot throw, at least very well. So, you know, I wanted to do something in sports if I could and I had to find an outlet. And, you know, when I was that little kid who was muting the TV and pretending to be the announcer and silly stuff like that. And, and as time got, uh, went on, you know, I sort of found this calling working in my high school newspaper and then my college newspaper and I realized that not only was I okay at it, I really, you know, really liked it. And it just sort of took off from there. How was your dream received by your family members? Uh, you know, fortunately, they're supportive, which is more than you could say uh, with a lot of journalists. I mean, obviously, the industry I'm in is not necessarily in the greatest shape. You know, newspapers and traditional media outlets are all having trouble. And it's not a particularly high paying field unless you're at the very, 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 very top of it, which obviously I aspire to become, but not there yet, obviously. Uh, so it did, it took support, you know, because it's very easy for, would have been very easy for my family to say, you should go to graduate school or you should go to law school or you should be a doctor or you should work in finance and make lots of money and do something that's stable. Because what I'm doing right now is not stable at all. I mean, it's, you know, you could lose your job at any time. That's just the reality of this industry, but fortunately I had, you know, a family, a support group. I think they understood the message of this podcast, which is if it's your dream, you should pursue it. And uh, if you want it badly enough, and if you work hard enough at it and you're good enough, you will overcome the obstacles. And uh, I think I'm off to a good start in that department and hopefully that continues. Well, I hope it continues for you too. What steps did you take to get started? So I guess in many ways, uh, it started at the end of high school when I said, okay, this is what I want to do. I, I want to go be a journalist. Uh, so when I was looking at colleges, I made my decision sort of based on very specific factors, which is 
It needs to have a good journalism program, and they need to have sports, big sports, big time sports. This is my, you know, I thought the best way to get where I want to be is go to college and cover big time sports. And I wound up at Syracuse University in upstate New York, which is one of the best basketball teams in the country and uh, used to be pretty good in football. And now it's pretty horrendous, but it's neither here nor there. And first day, pretty much. I mean, really the moment I got to school, you know, freshman year, 18 years old, whatever, went to the newspaper, went to the office and just said, I want to I want to write. I want to write about sports, you know, thinking that there'd be tons of people that were sort of in that boat, which there were. But, you know, I went right away and was said, I'll do anything. You know, I'll do anything you want me to do. And uh, they said, okay, you're covering uh, like cross country or track and field or something very minor. And, and I knew nothing about it. And no one cared at all. No one cares about cross country at Syracuse or anywhere. But I said, all right, I'm, sign me up. I'm doing it. You know, realizing, I think, that that's the step. The first step you have to take to getting where you want. And... As that time went on, I kept getting better assignments and better assignments and better assignments. And I ended up becoming the sports editor of the, of the paper at Syracuse, uh, which really is what propelled me to any success I've had since. Wow. And then how did you end up getting started with, with, with sports teams, like once you got out of college? Yeah. So, I, you know, baseball's always been what I loved the most and it was always what I wanted to cover. After my junior year, that summer of college, I had got an internship at MLB.com uh, covering the Yankees, which is, I grew up in New York, so that was a dream. You know, my dad and my brother are always big Yankee fans. I grew up a Yankee fan, so that was very cool. Cause I, that was my first sort of taste of covering professional baseball, and I said, "This is." I knew that's what I wanted, not knowing how quickly or if I'd ever get there. Then after my senior year, I got an internship in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, a newspaper called The Virginian Pilot. Just by good fortune, my assignment was covering a, a AAA baseball team called the Norfolk Tides, the AAA affiliate of the Baltimore Orioles, and uh, you know I loved it. And I thought was I thought I want to do this. I want to get into beat. I want to travel. I want to do it for real. That internship was coming to an end, and I was looking for a job. And I was very fortunate. About uh, three months, two months after the internship ended, I ended up getting hired at the Wall Street Journal. I had someone I, mean, I knew there who was an editor who was able to get me an interview and it was just dumb luck very very fortunate you know it's so much about just your circumstance good timing but I got into the journal and I was the lowest person at the paper I was 23 years old at the biggest newspaper in the country and uh, I was probably the lowest person there my assignment was basically do whatever no one else wanted that was basically what I had to do for about two years or a year and a half but again it was with the understanding or the hope that you work really hard at this and do really well at it, you'll get uh, where you want. And, you know, fortunately, the Mets reporter got promoted, leaving the position open. And I made it very clear for months that, you know, I want this. I want the opportunity. I was still very young. I was only 25, uh, which is pretty young for a baseball beat reporter, especially in New York. But fortunately, I guess I had shown them something to make them take a chance on me. And when they gave it to me, they were very sort of, adamant that you know this is a huge assignment and we really don't know if you're ready for it but here's your shot like go take advantage and uh it's so far gone really well i'm in my second year and i don't think they're considering taking me off at this point <laughs> it's nice when somebody decides to give somebody a shot it can be very special and and last a lifetime yeah you know they didn't need to they did i didn't even really deserve to be at the journal necessarily i mean even that was someone taking a shot that was and someone who i honestly barely knew you know i met him a couple times didn't know him very well he did not know me all that well at least as at least as well as he made it seem when he was vouching for me but he saw something in me and there was this position open at the journal and i guess they were having trouble filling it they had been interviewing for a while and and they hadn't found anyone they liked and this person, this this editor who no longer even works the paper, he left the paper just a few months after I got there, uh, so I really owe him a ton. Went to the boss, you know, his boss, who's the top editor of our section, and said, "Here's someone I know," and he gave him an interview, and and it got me in the door at a place that I I never really would have otherwise. I I may not have even been qualified to get in the door there. You know, this is not a place that hires kids fresh out of college very often. Uh, but it just shows sort of what you could do when you get that opportunity and how, and how much of it is just getting that break. And once you gain that break, taking advantage of it and sort of recognizing 
how fortunate you are and and sort of taking advantage of that opportunity. I think I remember reading a statistic somewhere where you're more likely to get a job from somebody you've met one time than you are from some of your best friends. I guess because first impressions are more important and your best friends know all your faults. <laughs> That's true. And I think there's, you know, I think there's something to be said. And this is something that I tell job seekers all the time when people ask uh, just about the whole concept of networking. And I think it's, you sort of see when you get out there, how do people hire? How does it work? I think when you're an applicant, especially a young applicant, you think that the the bosses are like huddled in some room having these in-depth, deep conversations about all the candidates. When in reality, they don't have time for that. They Really, if if they get a good recommendation and you and they like you, they'll hire you because that's like that's more important than anything you do in the interview is a good recommendation and and understand that a lot of bosses they're busy, they're stressed, they don't have time to be interviewing and debating over a pool of twenty twenty year old kids for a job. If you have twenty twenty year old kids and one of them comes with a recommendation from someone else in the company, it just puts you so far. Above, and I'm not trying to say that bosses are lazy. They're just busy, and recommendations, and they just mean a lot. And and that personal, that personal voucher, voucher for you, it goes such a long way. So the point is, everyone you meet could be the person that gets you in the door. And I think you always have to remember that. You know, even the someone that you meet at a job, they're the lowest of the low. They one day could be in a position to help you. And you know, I think that's something that everyone should always keep in mind. Or even the opposite, you know. I mean, you could be in a position to help somebody else someday. Yeah, you try to pay it forward, right? Like that's the, I hope that one day I meet a kid who deserves a shot, you know, and I could try to help him get it. Because someone did that for me. Lots of people have done that for me just to get all throughout my young career from the time I was in college to now. You know, people giving me chances that they made perhaps didn't need to give me, you know. So there's definitely an element of just luck and making your own luck. So were there any roadblocks along the way? Sure. I mean, there always are. I've been fortunate that uh, I haven't had as, as many as maybe other people do in my field. I know a lot of people I went to school with and other journalists that just had trouble getting jobs at a big place or getting a job. You know, they're covering high schools or they're in the middle of North Dakota. But that doesn't mean I haven't had, you know, my share of obstacles along the way. It took me you know, I had to, after Virginia, I didn't have anything for a while. I had to go back home, move back in with my parents for a while. And I was 23 almost. And, you know, I didn't want to move back home. I was, felt like I was out of school. I'm a grown up now. And, you know, that's a little humbling to an extent to have to move back, move back in when you kind of feel like you're out. And I was there for almost a year as I was trying to figure out where I'm going to get my job and then make enough money to actually move out, you know, after that. And, and also, you know, it might not sound like a roadblock, but it, to me it was. My first couple of years of the journal were tough. I was basically doing grunt work. It was very unglamorous. There were times when I felt that I wasn't going nowhere, that there was no, I was never going to move up. There was no room for mobility, that I was being, so I was stuck in this very like low, low job. Uh, and that was hard, you know, because you're, you, I was always used to moving quickly. You know, because I had been I had been doing well, and in college I was moved fast, and to sort of get to a place where all of a sudden you are not just not the best, you're the worst, and start from the bottom, and that's that's not easy, and and it took time, and look, I'm still nowhere near the top. I'm still in the overall scheme of things near the bottom, but at least I'm off the floor. Well, how how did you overcome some of those things? I think the first step or the first thing you have to have is confidence that you can overcome it. I mean, it would have been very easy for me. And I and I went through this where at times where I thought this isn't going to work. You know, maybe I need to figure, figure something else out. Maybe this isn't a long-term solution. And that's sort of a scary thought because for my a long time, I thought I knew what I wanted. And to sort of get to a point where all of a sudden you start to doubt yourself is, it's frightening. You start questioning sort of your own identity. And I, I went through that, but Ultimately, you know, with the support of some people that I care about and sort of my own inner strength and introspection sort of said, you know what, I know I am good enough for this. And when you get to that place where you feel confident, then it's just about working hard because the way you move up is by impressing people. And the way you impress people is by showing them that you care. And if that just means like going in earlier, staying late or 
going above and beyond what you're expected to do. That's what you have to do sometimes, especially when you know I was young and the expectations were low and sort of the belief was that maybe this kid's not ready or you know we're giving this kid taking a flyer on him. The only way to overcome that is by working your way out of it and and proving through your own sort of drive that you deserve another chance. And once I sort of committed and I didn't get that right away, but you know, it took some time, it took some beat downs, it took some performance reviews that were less than stellar at the journal. But so you have that wake up call, which is like, you got to take that step. Getting that in your head went, it went a long way for me. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we need to see our failures and our shortcomings to readjust ourselves to, to be more successful in the long term. Yeah. I needed that. You know, it was, it was tough being brought in after a year and basically being told, you know, you you know, you're not doing a great job or not even that, just like, you know, we think you could do better or you're not doing X. Just hearing anything negative is always hard, especially when, like I said, you know, I wasn't used to it, you know, and maybe that gave me a false sense of confidence or even arrogance that I just thought it's been relatively easy for me to this point. I've had a lot of success. It'll always be that way. And I think you're right. Sometimes you need to go through someone sort of telling you, you know, you, you got to be better to first wake you up and say, you know what, maybe you, you take a look at yourself and say, am I really doing the best I can? And being told you're not doing the best you can made me sort of look myself in the mirror and say, you're right, I'm not. And I don't know if I would have even realized that otherwise. And that as much as it hurts, it, you use it as motivation. It's like, I could show you that you're wrong. And I think that's okay to have that, that sense of, uh, I'll show you. You know, it sounds like a negative, but it's not. It's not hostile. It, it's not that I was angry. It was, I want to prove you wrong. I want to show you that I'm better than maybe you think I am. And getting that, you know, getting that motivation could really propel you forward. So has there been any parts of your dream that haven't quite worked out? You know, I don't know if I've really fully accomplished my dream yet. You know, I think I'm, I'm on the way. I love what I'm doing. It's one of these things where when I started... I, this was my goal. I wanted to cover Major League Baseball. I want to be a beat reporter. But that's not my ultimate goal. You know, this job I have right now requires a lot of travel and involves being away from my wife and my family a lot. You know, half the year, basically, I'm on the road, you know, and that's not the life I want forever. But I also love what I'm doing. So in a way, achieving this phase of my goal has made me reassess what my dreams are and start searching for a new dream in a way. I mean, my dream is still what I'm doing. But it's sort of figuring out how to have my cake and eat it too. How could I continue living this dream while also having sort of the lifestyle I want and and being able to sort of not be on the road as much and and have a family that's relatively normal, family life, for instance. And, and I don't quite know where that step is. I don't know what the next move is, you know. But I think that's sort of the only way you really achieve success is when you do accomplish your dreams. You always should have another dream right behind it because... I still have a lot of time left. If I've already accomplished what I want to accomplish when I'm four years out of college or whatever it is, that's not fulfilling. You know, you always should be aspiring for something better than what you have. And I think that's sort of, that's the way you may, you move forward is by always thinking you could do better after you accomplish something. And that's sort of where I am right now. I don't know what my next dream is, but I know it's, it's, it's coming. Well, well, let's just jump to the question, what are your dreams for the future? I mean, huh. you kind of just answered it, but I'm sure you got to have something, whether it's in baseball or sports or, or in life in general. Yeah, there's lots of options. I mean, look, I love working in the media, you know, and I've always thought maybe I could, I'd be on TV one day. Or maybe, you know, instead of covering a daily beat, I'll work for a magazine and get to write long form articles. You know, maybe I'll, TV is an exciting option to me, you know, something like that, where you're, you're more out there, your face is out there, you get to talk sort of a different spin on what I'm already doing. But maybe it's not in journalism. You know, I also have a lot of interest in baseball and other aspects. I mean, we're in this place in baseball now where you could do so much with it. You know, I, I'm very interested in, in analytics and statistics. And there's so many people doing incredible research. You know, you do something like that and write about it. And, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll, there's always the chance that I end up wanting to work in baseball. Who, who's to say I couldn't work for a team someday? Why you could dream big? Why can you be a general manager of a team someday? You know, is that likely? Probably not. You know, is that even necessarily what I want? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, there's a lot out there. 
there's a lot of exciting things that this could lead to. It's one of the great things of what I do. One of the great things working at a place like the Wall Street Journal is that you never know where it's going to take you. And I think the the sort of those options are all are all out there. I'm kind of excited to see where where it goes. So if you were stranded on a deserted island with your with your family, what three things would you want to have with you? We have to bring a, a Springsteen album, the, the essential Bruce Springsteen three disc set, because if I'm on a deserted island, I need good music for the rest of my life, and that's as good as it gets. So that's coming, that's coming with us. Something that my wife could bake in, because she'd be very sad if she couldn't bake. That's her her biggest hobby, a thing she loves the most baking things which is great for me because i get to do the eating something that she could bake with like an easy bake oven it's fine i don't know we could plug it in somewhere maybe i don't know maybe it could run on batteries and maybe our ketubah which is a jewish piece of artwork that you must sign and, and people sign when you get married it's basically like a wedding it's basically like a jewish marriage license but they're very artistic they're drawn by these artists, very beautiful, with writing on it about your marriage. And you have to sign it, and your witnesses have to sign it. And right now it's framed in our house, sort of in our living room. That would come too, because that's kind of an emotional attachment. So is there any last thoughts you'd like to share? If I've learned anything, and the, the sort of message I would tell to everyone is, the way you accomplish your dream is really just being nice to people. And giving people a reason to want to help you. Because like no one could do things by themselves. Everyone needs help. Everyone needs someone to get them in the door. Everyone needs someone to want to take a chance on you. And the way you do that is just by always working hard and always being nice to people. And showing everyone you meet that you know, no matter what you think of me, no matter where my skills are, I will always try. I'll always do my best. And I'll always try to go above and beyond what you want of me. And if you do that, you have a shot. And that's all you could ask for. So before we go, is there any Twitter, Facebook, website you'd like to plug? Sure. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. It's just at Jared Diamond, J-A-R-E-D, and then Diamond, like baseball diamond. Very fitting for what I do. I mainly am talking about the Mets, but there's some other fun stuff thrown around in there. So, you know, if you like baseball or you just want to hear my ramblings off besides just this podcast, feel free to check it out. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Jared. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Dreamers Podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Dreamers Podcast. Join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dreamers Podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the Dreamers Podcast, please send an email to j at jpar.co. This podcast is copyright 2014 by jpar.co.